Good morning, church. Uh, welcome to the second in the series, Beginnings. Uh, last week, Lyd explored the big question, why did God create the world? And Lyd focused on the Trinity and how God created us out of love and to have relationship with us. And today we're going to shift the focus ever so slightly and we're going to look at the natural world around us. And this morning we're going to ask the question, does creation matter to God? Now, last Christmas, I got this wonderful little wildlife camera. Um, I've been after one of these for a while. And uh, I'd noticed in my back garden that something kept on knocking down one of my fence panels. So I set this thing up and, uh, and lo and behold, it was a fox that kept on jumping over the fence at night and knocking it over. And um, it's brilliant, it's so lovely to see this thing uh, just doing its thing in the back garden when we're all tucked up in bed and uh, nature is alive all around us. And uh, the camera's also picked up um, a little hedgehog that's been, uh, that we're now feeding <laughs> because it's probably should have been tucked up in bed by now. Um, so it's great to be able to give them a little hand, um, especially since hedgehogs are on their decline uh, in the UK and they're really good for wildlife. <clears throat> now, I absolutely love the natural world. I always have. And, um, but it's interesting, isn't it, to sit back and ask the question, does God care about that fox and that hedgehog that keeps visiting my garden? Does it please God if I feed them and look after them? Or maybe God isn't interested at all. Maybe there are much bigger issues in life like famine and poverty and injustice, which God is more bothered about. Now, this morning, I want to suggest that God is most certainly and deeply interested in the world that he created. And I also want to suggest that the way that we treat creation can have a profound impact on other areas of life, such as poverty and global injustice. So we're not just talking about fluffy bunnies here. We're talking about caring for creation, the whole of creation. So before we get started, let's pray. Father God, we acknowledge you as the Lord of all creation. And we praise you for your creative works and we thank you for the beautiful world that you've given us to enjoy and to look after. Help us today, God, through your word and through your spirit to help us understand about your heart for creation. Amen. OK, so I wonder what you think about the natural world. There's two books which... Um, I'm going to be referencing a lot today and much of this preach is drawn from these. The uh, first one is uh, called Planet Wise by Dave Buckless and the other one is called Creation Care by Douglas and Jonathan Moo. And um, in this book Dave uh, comes up, he defines um, four types of Christians that he's come across when he has conversations about environmental issues. And the first are those who think that environmental issues are a little bit dodgy. You know, Christians should steer clear of them for risk of being labelled as tree huggers or hippies or, you know, perhaps worshipping Mother Earth and so on. And the second group of Christians are those who think that environmental issues are irrelevant. They would say that the gospel is about saving people, not animals. Now, some of these Christians would go so far as to say that climate change is a myth and that given that Christ will return one day, what's the point in trying to save the earth? And actually, this is quite a, a dominant theological stance among uh, uh, evangelicals in America. And it's a really dangerous theology to have. Now, the third type of Christians are those who would say, well, I'm glad that someone's caring about them, but it doesn't have to be me. And then there's the fourth group, which I hope we all identify with. This is the group who know that concern for the whole of God's creation is fundamental to the God of the Bible and to his purposes for human beings. So we're going to dig into the Bible a lot this morning. What does the Bible tell us about creation? Now I've got four points and my point number one is that creation is by God and for God. Now the Bible is absolutely clear that all creation belongs to God. Exodus 19 verse 5, the whole earth is mine. Psalm 24 verse 1, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Psalm 50, 10 to 12, 
Every animal of the forest is mine, and the cattle on a thousand hills. I know every bird in the mountain, and the insects in the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell you, for the world is mine, and all that is in it. Psalm 89 verse 11, the heavens are yours, and yours also the earth. You founded the world and all that is in it. These are just one of uh, a couple of many, many scriptures that tell us that God is the creator and sustainer of all things. He knows every single animal and insect on the planet. Now, not only is the whole earth God's, he sees it all as good. In the opening chapters of Genesis, we get a rich picture of God's character and creative works. And in each of the first six days, God creates something new. And each day he steps back and declares, it is good. Now Genesis 1 verse 31 says this, And God saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. You see, the impression is that all creatures, plants, stars, oceans, bring him praise and glory simply by being what they were created to be. And notice that God was delighting in his creation even before humans came on the scene. It's not the case that creation is important because of us, because of the value that we give to creation. Rather, creation is important to God, aside from us. You know, when you look up and see the night stars, they don't shine for you and I. They shine for him. You see, we need to shift our human-centred view of the world and rediscover a biblical God-centered view of creation. And it's interesting to note that in Genesis chapter one, when God breathed into the man who he formed, the man became a living being. And the Hebrew words for living are nefesh kaya. And it's interesting to note that the same Hebrew words uh, are used when God breathed life into animals not just humans. So animals are also nefesh kaya, the same as humans. It's also important to note that God did not stop caring about creation when he rested on day seven. He didn't put his feet up and say to the natural world, okay, I'm done, go for it. He continued to be involved and he continues to be involved in his creation today. Psalm 104 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible and it mirrors the opening chapters of Genesis, and it gives us plenty of insight. I'm just gonna read a couple of verses from it, but I do encourage you to go and read the whole thing on your own. He makes springs pour water into the ravines. It flows between the mountains. They give water to all the beasts of the field. The wild donkeys quench their thirst. The trees of the Lord are well watered, the cedars of Lebanon that he planted. There the birds make their nests. The stork has its home in the junipers. The high mountains belong to the wild goats. The crags are a refuge for the hirax. The lions roar for their prey and seek their food from God. The psalm goes on for 35 verses, praising the incredible creative and sustaining power of God. And it tells us about a God who cares and provides for all plants and all animals everywhere even when they serve no purpose to humans. You know, it's funny, isn't it? In fact, God sustains animals such as lions that are even life-threatening to us. Now, science is revealing more and more about the beauty and the complexity of God's creative, sustaining power. And it shows us that all life is connected. When we pollute one part of the earth, it has knock-on effects everywhere else. When we rewild one part of the world, it has knock-on effects everywhere else. When we pour weed killer over our lawns, it not only kills the weeds, but it kills a whole host of other things which are beneficial to other plants and animals along the line. You get the picture. You see, biodiversity is important to our survival. And yet so often we see creation as something to exploit, as merely a backdrop to our lives. I think we need to rethink our place in the world. A biblical perspective shows that we are just one of many species who inhabit the planet together and who need to live and, uh, and care uh, together for the world that we live in. 
And it's interesting to note that many of the wild species described in the Bible are actually no longer present due to human actions. We've destroyed much of the creative material that the psalmist used as inspiration for Psalm 104. Now, the Bible is also clear that God cares for plants and animals in parts of the world where no humans are watching. You know, it's great, isn't it? When, when I look back on my um, wildlife camera footage, you know, no human was watching when that fox was doing its thing, but God was. In the story of Job, God, re God uh, replies to one of Job's complaints by saying, Job, who cuts a channel for the flood or clears a path for the thunderbolt? to bring rain on a barren land, on a desert where no man lives, to satisfy the parched wasteland and make it sprout with tender grass. You see, nothing is outside of God's view. Even if it doesn't matter to us, it matters to God. And that's one reason that each of us has a huge responsibility on the way that we live our lives. Now, a while ago, um, uh, we... Uh, realised that some of the chocolate spread that we were giving to the kids on their toast contained palm oil. Now commercial oil farm, palm oil farms are causing widespread devastation of rainforests which in turn is having huge social local impacts but also global impacts too on climate. Now I can't see the rainforest when I'm eating my toast with chocolate spread but I couldn't knowingly buy it again. You know, these things concern God and they should influence our behaviour. You see, we don't need a crisis to care for creation. It should just be part of our natural worship of the Creator. And my second point is that creation helps us to understand the Creator. Dave Bookless writes that God is a great artist and the world his canvas. Creation speaks fluently and eloquently about God. God has quite deliberately left us clues about who he is and creation is his universal way of telling everyone who he is. Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have clearly been seen, being understood through what has been made so that they are without excuse. Creation is a natural place of encounter with God. And by this, I don't mean that we should worship creation, but rather creation testifies to the greatness of God. It's an orchestra that's constantly praising that we can join in with every time we step out of the front door. Charles Spurgeon once wrote, Doth not all nature around me praise God? If I were silent, I should be an exception to the universe. Doth not the thunder praise him as it rolls like drums in the march of the God of armies? Do not the mountains praise him when the woods upon their summits wave in adoration? Does not the lightning write his name in letters of fire? Hath not the whole earth a voice? And shall I, can I, silent be? Since the outbreak of the coronavirus, I've listened to far fewer uh, YouTube worship songs and obviously we've not been able to meet together to corporately sing. But I have been more inclined to sit outside in my garden and use creation as a stimulus, as an inspiration for worshipping and praising uh, the mighty God that I know and that I love and who I used to worship in a different way before coronavirus. You see, creation inspires us to worship and it also gives us insight into the character of God. Creation shows us a God who loves the wild. Creation shows us a God who cares about the big and the small and the unseen. Creation shows us a God who is deeply mathematical. He is both the scatty artist and the wise mathematician. And we now have a complete canon of scripture that helps us to understand God even more. Now my third point is that creation helps us to understand our place in the world. Genesis poetically tells us that we are formed from the dust of the ground and that we were formed on the same day as animals. Both human and animals are living beings as we've, 
said, both are nefesh kaya. Yet while we are part of God's creation, we are also set apart. Humans have a special role to play. In Genesis 1, 26 to 28, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Dave Brookless writes that we are both earthbound creatures and also God's image bearers. No other species on the planet has this distinction. You see, we have dominion over creation, but we are not God. All the earth is his, as we've already seen. We're just temporary stewards. It's interesting to note that one of the earliest commands that God gives humans is in the Garden of Eden, where God tells man to keep the garden. In Genesis chapter 2, we, we read that the Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. There's a sense here that God entrusts humans to rule over the earth. In the Genesis passage, the man is clearly intended as a representative figure for all humanity. Each of us then has a responsibility to work the garden and to look after it. Now the Hebrew word um, for keep in the sentence, keep the garden, is shamar. It means to watch over or guard. And interestingly, it's the same word used in the blessing in number six. The Lord bless you and keep you, shamar you. The authors Douglas and Jonathan Moo point out that as image bearers of God, our care and protection of the earth is thus a reflection of the care and protection that God shows us. So it's really clear that God intends humans to care for the earth, not to exploit it. And we can go a step further. The creation story in Genesis makes it absolutely clear that we should care for each other too, with the same care and protection that God shows us. Let us make man in our image, said God. This passage and others show clearly that all human beings, without exception, are created in the image of God and are to be treated as such. Every single human being that has ever walked the planet, that is alive today, that will be born, is made in the image of God. Every baby, every child, every adult, every person with mental or physical disabilities, everyone in every part of the world, regardless of faith, identity or background, all are made in the image of God. And we've got so much to repent of for marginalising people or treating them less than as God has made them. A biblical perspective on creation demands that we treat everyone as human beings made in the image of God. And just as God has made everyone in his image, he desires every person to come to faith in Jesus Christ and start on that lifelong process of discipleship. It's on this road of discipleship that we realise more and more about the person that God created us to be, about the plans and the purposes that God has for our lives. This message is radically different to the common view that we're all just simply the result of a cosmic accident. Psalm 139 says this, For you created my innermost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful, I know that full well. Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. Karl Barth says this, when man accepts his destiny in Jesus Christ, he is only like a latecomer slipping shamefacedly into creation's choir in heaven and earth, which has never ceased its praise. My fourth and final point is that creation helps us to care for our neighbours. Caring for creation is one simple way 
to reflect God's loving character. When we care for creation, not only do we help to reverse the damage we've done, we also show God's love to everyone alive on the planet today and to the generations of children who are going to inhabit the world that we leave for them. That's why tending the garden is one of the first commands that God gives to us. Scientists are clear that climate change is having the greatest impact on the world's poorest communities first. Our individual choices have global consequences, be it buying products containing palm oil or pouring weed killer on our lawns. Every action we make reflects our theology. And the church in the West has been slow to respond to God's call to tend the garden. We've been slow to realise that our decisions that we make on a daily basis are not just practical ones, they're thoroughly spiritual. You know, my energy pack package was up for renewal the other day and uh, the easiest option was just to let it renew. But I'd just signed Threshold up to be an eco-church and I had this gnawing voice in my head about authenticity. So I sat down and I spent 25 minutes switching uh, my energy provider and now all of my home energy comes from wind farms. So it took a bit of time, but these simple changes lead to a more biodiverse world with a greater positive impact on environmental justice. Our theology must inform our practice. And that is why Threshold has joined the Eco Church Initiative. Over the months and years to come, we will be making changes as a church and we will be encouraging you to make changes as individuals that further publicly demonstrate our love for God, his world and the people who inhabit it. After all, we are just stewards and caretakers. Dave Buckless writes this, this is a time of great opportunity for Christians. If only we will look again at the Bible, listen to God's challenge and be prepared to change our own lifestyles. So I'd like to leave us with a response. I want to leave us with three questions to consider. And you can apply these questions to your personal life, to your family life, or perhaps as an employee of a company. First question is this, do my choices honour the creation that God sees as good? The second question, are my choices directly or indirectly causing suffering to others around the world or jeopardising future generations? And a third question, Am I treating everyone as a person created in God's image? Are there prejudices I need to deal with? Let's pray as we close. Father God, thank you for your word. Thank you that you see all creation is good. Thank you that you created us to care and to enjoy the world you created. Thank you that your word brings life. Thank you that Jesus is the Lord of all and that we have opportunity to know you. Help us to make wise choices, responsible choices. Help us to display the love of Jesus everywhere we go, in every action, through our theology, through our practice. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.